<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first session of uh, the Draw of the Desert Seminar with Reza Negristani. Uh, nearly 15 years after the publication of Cyclonopedia, 21 years after the English translation of uh, Ibrahim Al-Kuni's Al Anubis, a desert novel, and 58 years since the arrival of Frank Herbert's Dune, this seminar brings the logic of the desert in all its political, economic, technological, military, and mystical mirages to the, doors, to the doorsteps of philosophy. Beginning with the rise of monotheism, uh, moving towards esoteric tales of political strife by prophets, philosophers, travelers, soldiers, CIA agents, and oil tycoons. We will embark on a journey where the idea of the desert coincides with the strongest ambitions of the humankind, failed or otherwise. This seminar is designed to provide a set of armamentariums through which uh, philosophers can be initiated into the mundus imaginalis we call the limit upon all thoughts, cunnings and discourses by those who still live uh, uh, on the planet Earth. Um, uh, our instructor today is uh, Reza Negristani. Uh, Reza is a philosopher. He has contributed contributed extensively to journals and anthologies and lectured at numerous international universities and institutions. His current philosophical project is focused on rationalist universalism, beginning with the evolution of the modern system of knowledge and advancing toward contemporary philosophies of rationalism their procedures, as well as their demands for special forms of human conduct. He is the author of Cyclonopedia, Repress 2008, and Intelligence and Spirit, MIT Press, Urbanomic 2018. Um, uh, uh, hi, Reza, and now uh, please take it away. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Apparently, we are not going to have introduction today, but next session, and uh, we will do it. Uh, and of course, this causes a little bit of problem uh, because I only prepared for the second half after the introduction. Regardless, we can always uh, you know, buy time by discussions. So uh, <clears throat> let me read uh, you know, uh, the syllabus, uh, the text, this short, short, text that I wrote uh, for the syllabus to kind of uh, get us in a good point, um, a starting point. So you might ask, where is the desert? Where is the desert is a central question of this seminar, not what is the desert. The seminar aims less to excel in exploring the theme of the desert as a respectable philosophical topic relevant to our troubled times, more to adopt the experience of the desert, its sheer cunning come candor, to draw in the unsuspected through a dynasty of fading and unveiling mirages. It serves as a method, a modus operandi, or a much needed ethos of philosophical conduct in our time. In light of this, the progression of this seminar appears increasingly like a Homeric philosophical voyage, but is, in fact, an estranged wandering, or perhaps meandering. Unlike the Odyssey, there will be no attainment of a sense of fulfillment, because it is precisely that sense of fulfillment that is being challenged by the draw of the desert. Through this wandering, ideas of self, social relationships, and civilization can be challenged and reassessed. Each session of this seminar resembles a rendezvous at last chance or last stop. Colloquial names given to places situated in the middle of nowhere. Here, participants are faced with the decision to either return home or continue the journey by securing provisions to move forward by way of one last chance. <clears throat> so, perhaps the best point of entry for us to talk about the desert 
would be a very context sensitive, contextualized sort of beginning. In this contextualized, I want to talk about this point of beginning, talking about the desert um, from what I am familiar with, right? That would be Middle Eastern uh, idea of the desert, right? And perhaps the entire seminar is made around only Middle Eastern deserts, right? Uh, perhaps, you know, um, North African deserts as well, but we are not interested in sort of deserts which are uh, usually being used for, for mere uh, cozy reprieve from civilization. We are not interested in an idea of a desert uh, which offers uh, solitude from civilization, but rather the other of civilization. We are only interested in desert as the other of civilization. And by what I'm going to talk about, it is perhaps also the other of philosophy. It doesn't make it a philosophical or anti-philosophical. Rather, it's just a philosophy that ought to be forged through the thought of Arabian and Middle Eastern deserts would be would require a different sort of philosophy, a different ideation of what I call a renegotiation between thought knowledge, technique, and in their relationship with polis, civilization. So that's one that I want to, that one way to go and talk about this. And the other one, precisely because of the Middle Eastern context of the sort of desert, uh, notion of desert we are talking about, I think it's absolutely important for you to have a little bit of, I don't know, um, preparatory, introductory materials, thoughts and ideas, no matter how small might they be or how you know dispersed they might be, about literally the influence of desert on Middle Eastern religions, mysticism, and philosophy, right? That would be kind of like a historical background that I think uh, we should know before venture out. Because as you remember, desert is not a place that you can venture out with some provisions. These provisions doesn't need to be food, but they need to be certain sort of diamond clear crystallized bullets that you have to carry around with you while traveling on the desert. <clears throat> so let's start with, and I'm going to, I'm just, this session is going to be introduction and I'm going to somehow recap the entire seminar, right? At least not recap the, the conclusions uh, because it's too early, but rather what we are going to do, uh, what sort of trajectories we are going to take. Um, so it is clear to you that philosophy as understood in its, what you might call to be primordial manifestations, it would be just Greek, Chinese, and Persian. And that doesn't mean that there are not other sort of philosophies in the world during that time, of the, of the great you know, civilization. It's just that what we now know as philosophy, as a discipline, institutionalized or not, is essentially the fruitation of certain sorts of either implicit or explicit relationships with civilization. 
endemic to the very idea of philosophy itself. We can talk about Socrates, we can talk about uh, Confucianism, we can talk about you know, early Persian uh, so-called mage philosophers, right? Or king philosophers during the Sasanid era. <clears throat> but I mean, let's actually talk about something that we can uh, you know, have a little bit background knowledge about, and that would be you know, Greek, Greek-centric philosophy, right? Uh, Socrates. As you know, Socrates uh, introduces philosophy as always being in response, not perhaps reaction, but also I would say that the reaction as well, but in response to a phenomenon known as polis, civilization. And of course, you know what we are going to do? We are going to show that the idea of civilization is far more fluid than these sorts of Tower of Babel, Greek city-states of Athens, you know, Perse, police, Chinese civilization. We want to do that. But first, we have to go through, you know, the understanding of what civilization, what polis actually means for these people. And... This is not something that we are going to do it right this session, but nevertheless, we can talk about it. So yes, Socrates for the first time absolutely uh, understands philosophy uh, as, uh, as a bipatriate uh, discipline which at the same time concerns with moral virtues, practical moral virtues and knowledge. Virtue for him is knowledge. You should understand that from pre-Socratic themes, uh, moral virtue, right? Uh, practical moral virtue is often uh, associated with the conduct of polis, of its citizens, right? Of those who contribute to civilization. It actually doesn't really uh, pertain to people who are outside of polis. It is a world building in a civilizational sort of sense, philosophy in that sense, right? And of course, there are examples of uh, what you might call to be the outlanders in Greek philosophy, so-called outlanders. And let me tell what outlanders are. You, you most probably have heard of the Etruscans, right? Or the idea of the barbers, the barbaric people, the barbarians, right? The barbarian is not actually something that Greeks were called people who are outside of civilization, right? They were merely outlanders. Barbarian is simply being distinguished by the dialect, by language, not by ideology. It is not as if Greeks thought that certain sort of people are barbarians in the sense that we talk about barbarians in modern sense, right? How usually this word is being colloquially manipulated. No, barbarian is simply barbar, -bar, right? It's a certain sort of dialect, dialect that doesn't uh, that doesn't bode well uh, with a Greek ear, right? It creates a certain sort of harsh dissonance. So the barber is merely an outlander. Outlander, outlander simply means. Um, a bunch of people that surround the Greek city-states, right? That would be the Etruscans, that would be the Persians. Per Persians are, Persians is like the rival civilization, right? But nevertheless, they are outlanders. And then later on, this idea of the outlander becomes uh, 
becomes more you know, ideologically charged as the barbarian, as someone who threatens civilization. And of course, there are good reason for this. It's precisely because the outlanders um, posed existential threats to the Greek city-states. One, uh, by way of the Etruscan pirates, the Etruscans were mostly marauding civilization, right? At the open sea, they usually target, uh, you know, uh, what you might call to be merchant ships. Think about Houthis today, right? What they do at the, at the Red Sea, right? And they are quite specific in terms of who they are targeting. They're often targeting Greek ships, right? And uh, to the point, to the point that uh, you know, in the sort of mythologies uh, or folklore, Greek folklore uh, around the outlander, around the people who live outside of civilization, out of the polis. Um, there is this port uh, close to Athens, Pyria, right? Um, which is a, it's a very strange sort of place in, in Greek uh, folklore. It is haunted. It is simply haunted. Like it's a cursed place. And why is it cursed? Precisely because uh, This is the port, the only port in Greek city estates where merchant ships take the route that ultimately expose them to the outlanders. And it's not as if outlanders always want to threaten merchant ships of the Greek nature. Sometimes they do actually trade. There is a huge amount of communication between them, huge amount of exchange, trade, so on and so forth. But they are not abiding by the laws of the Greek city estates. So that's one. And the other one, uh, the reason why outlanders become ultimately barbarians as threats to civilization would be in a twisted sort of way, another great civilization of the time, perhaps even bigger civilization by the virtue of its diversity. And that would be the Persian Empire, right? Made and forged under Cyrus II, who in fact, by all definition, is a paragon example of the just king and the just founder of a civilization that Alexander of Macedonia tries to emulate. Right? That would be uh, Chiropedia, Xenophanes' Xenoph uh, Chiropedia, the, the, the book on Cyrus the Great. So, because of, so we should understand that this whole idea that, that Greek civilization and Greek uh, centricity of its emphasis on polis render some people outlander doesn't literally mean that the outlanders automatically are called threats to civilization. It becomes a threat to civilization precisely because one of these outlanders is actually the rival of the Greek civilization. Right. <clears throat> so yes, Socrates, knows quite a great deal about this sort of stuff. He knows, you know, that it is not as if uh, philosophy wants to safeguard its integrity against the outlanders, this sort of, you know, kind of vacuous myths in 20 and 21st century are being peddled by, you know, complete and critical theory about that, well, you know, perennially philosophy has always warded off the outlander. No, 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 
The outlander is just there. It's just by the virtue of the boundary of the polis, right? Polis has a boundary, it's a place. And it has boundaries, and it has functions which are demarcated. And what lies outside of it is just called outlander. The barbaric nature of the outlander comes later. And it's not really Greek, to be honest with you. It's actually Roman. So, Socrates, as you know, Socrates' entanglement in philosophy and the idea of the of polis uh, predates that of the elaboration, the definitional elaboration provided by Aristotle. Merely philosophy during the time of Plato and Socrates and pre-Socratic uh, philosophers has is vocationally is vocationally entangled with the idea of civilization by virtue of the entanglement between moral virtues and moral practices and theoretical practices. It is Aristotle who elaborates this, perhaps wrongly, and we will talk about why wrongly in other sessions, the relation between politics and philosophy, that the actually political life and moral life predate a philosophical life. And philosophical life is nothing more than a theoretical life par excellence. But Socrates refuses this. Uh, and if he was alive uh, during the time of Aristotle, he would have refused this completely. That would be a betrayal of the ethics of what philosophy is. And that's why uh, Socrates finds himself in a fatal collision with the representative representatives of police with the tyrants and the citizens out of his complete refusal to clearly cut the distinction between uh, you know um, moral practices belonging to a political life and uh, And, and philosophical life, theoretical knowledge. However, there is something in Socrates which is a little bit interesting. So Socrates already knows that polit politics, right, writ large, is about two things actually, in his own terms, moral virtue, virtue, and power. And he wants to insist that it is philosophy that trains politics to be good. So what does that mean, training politics to be good? Well, meaning that politics should relinquish its primary connection with power meaning that power should not be the defining characteristics of politics, but rather only virtue. They're striving for the good, for the good life, right? And the good life as we know it, in the allegory of the divided line by Plato, always is, by definition, entangled with uh, right, entangled with uh, knowledge, right? With epistemology, with mathematics, with ideas and so on and so forth. So I think Socrates 
articulation of the relation between endemic relation between philosophy and police um, renders philosophy both extremely strong, politically robust, but also so extremely politically fragile. Because whether Socrates likes it or not, whether Plato likes it or not, politics is a locus of power. And not just power, but the modus operandi of exacting and exercising such power. And when I'm saying the modus operandi, I mean it's in the sense of a strategy of civilization building, a strategy, cunning. Matisse, as the Greek used to say it, right? Cunning intelligence, Macr. Now, strangely, it seems that to a great extent, Philosophy is not philosophy of the Plato and Socrates, it's not only against uh, you know, the relation between philosophy and politics as a locus of power, but also, and most importantly and fundamentally, against the relation of how politics exercises its power within the confines of the polis of civilization, Matisse. Cunning. But then, if further, when you think about it more deeply, you notice something is amiss. It's just missing there. It is merely politics, the way of the civilization or the polis that is capable of exacting cunning on the enemies, or on the rivals. Is Matisse or cunning or techniques of cunning is only exclusive to the conduct of the police? Absolutely not. The more we get into this seminar, we see that in fact, it is the other of the polis that is the sublimation of the way of cunning. But a cunning that is not merely political. Right? But rather a cunning which is the missing link between knowledge and virtue. And that's the way of the desert. So before I move forward, uh, let's just, uh, let me, one second, let me, I'm coming back in 30 seconds and then we will have some questions and answers. All right. And of course, I should say before we start uh, Q and A, uh, strangely enough, uh, when I said, "Well, you know, 
So what is it exactly that makes deserts other than the police? Well, because deserts, and that's sort of Middle Eastern, Near Eastern, North African formulation, just doesn't have any sorts of ambitions to settle, any ambitions to build. In the same sense that Greeks understand of building, of construction, right? Of ideas, of, of cities, of civilizations, of gardens. No, desert actually can build. In desert, you can build so many things. But it's just not of the nature of the polis, of the city, right? And I will talk about this, you know, that there is a time, in fact, this is not a time actually, it's just like a progression, that in Middle Eastern uh, vocabularies, uh, desert finally is being realized or recognized as the other of the police, meaning the inhabitants of the desert, so-called desert nomads, finally come to this realization concretely and fully that that's exactly why they shouldn't set foot in a city. Because they don't belong there. And the fact that they don't belong there don't, doesn't make them better or worse than those who those people who call themselves civilized, but rather their idea of civilization is fundamentally different. It's something that you might call to be being at peace with a politics for which there is no city. There is no bildung. There is no living space in the Heideggerian sense realm. <clears throat> so go on, ask, ask questions, throw me some stuff so we can move forward. Maxim, uh, can go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm going to try to be brief. I'm just going to try to bounce some uh, take on the reading. And I want to say that the text, the Corbin sex, is just amazing. So to connect it to Dune, that's why, why I love Lynch's Dune and I hate Villeneuve's Dune because I think Lynch's Dune is properly metaphysical, right? In Villeneuve's Dune, there is this message that life is not a riddle to solve, but reality to experience. And both are passive. Uh, I'm either seeing, experiencing something, or I'm thinking about something. When for Lynch, you might add this exactly the third dimension, the intermediate dimension that Corbin is talking about, that you may say life is a miracle to imagine. It's not just... It's beyond, and Lynch's Dune is beyond understanding, but you may also say it's beyond experience. It's just bizarre. It just throws you off at some point. Like, what is this? What does that mean? Like, what is even, like, even it throws off your perception, even not just understanding. That's why I think right, it's great. Right, and Herbert right. also liked it. But no, um, I think that will, yeah. uh, uh, how do you pronounce the Canadian's director's name? The, the French guy, the Quebecian Will know. Will know. Will know. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, he has some some good parts in his movie, too. Like, you know, oh, sure. uh, it, oh, the, the thing is that, um, you know, the the desert guy uh, goes into the throne of, uh, you know, these new people, the, the one who have just landed on the planet. And, you know, he starts to spit and other people think that he's just is barbarian, right? But it's just like actually honoring them. And then he, they, they, they tell him that, well, you know, we are going to give you uh, 
this amount of money, we are going to make you rich. I said, what sort of riches are you going to give me, right? All I need is water, right? And uh, yes, desert is actually the only place where money loses its meaning. Literally, money loses its meaning. Literally. Uh, still, there are deserts. And people in the deserts, that if you offer them as a tourist, United States goddamn greenback dollar, they are not going to accept it. What are they supposed to do with it? Literally, what are they supposed to do with a dollar? It's just a piece of paper. That is not an abstraction that they understand. And for good reasons, it's an abstraction of a very specific idea of civilization. It is not global, it is not universal. And yes, uh, in Villeneuve's uh, movie, if you notice that every time that one of these desert people talks, it has a very cryptic language. It's like, that's, that's called a barber talking, right? It doesn't mean that it's barbaric in, in the sense that we use the word barbarism. It just simply means that it is not uh, a language that shares the same sort of experiences, perceptions, mirages, and images of the so-called civilization. Oh yeah, the Love's movie, of course, it's it's wonderful, but it, it it's fault is trying to be beautiful. I would say it's it leans too much in the dimension. Yeah, yeah. Of I mean, of course. I mean, he wants to be epic. Yeah. He wants to be epic, epic, right? He wants to be beautifully epic, right? That's just like a. I would say that it's like a French fault, I would say. Mm. You know, you always make a beautiful thing out of everything. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I just want to finish my point really briefly that from Corbin's text, so this three dimensions between the thinking, and pure intellect, and pure perception, there is imagination in the middle. That's why I thought Lynch's Dune shows it really well. And this is why I love Lynch's Inland Empire, because it's the distance between me being here and the extras playing on the other side of the screen. But it's right. also the distance between me being a dude just ranting and me being a student in a philosophy seminar trying to kind of make some philosophical point. And I think that this distance is exactly what Deleuze is calling repetition. That's why he's saying that repetition is a, is like a soul or like a mirror. It's this stepping up into a different space where I am right, right, just right. a person in one hand, but at the same time, I'm something else. Right, right, right. But right. this, the distance, if there is a distance, if the, uh, there is a distance between me and the actors that has to be traversed, then this distance must exist in space. And this space is like this nowhere land that he's talking about. Yeah, and, no about, no about yes. yes, yes. And the same thing, there is a distance between us just being strangers and maybe there could be some moment of like, <laughs> like venturing to the desert, some kind of a moment of intellectual right, right, right. communion. So, so essentially, I want to say this right from the beginning, uh, although cryptically, I'm a barbarian too, right? Um, that the very idea of the desert is that precise distance, not quantitative, not even perhaps qualitative, that makes the idea of other to shine. What is other when we talk about the other? <clears throat> the other of philosophy, the other of, the other of men, the other of patriarchy, the other of this and that. <clears throat> well, that's the desert. That's Nakojabad. So uh, more, more, uh, hopefully from the silent people, Megan, thank you for taking the class again. You say something. <clears throat> Um, I can say something. Um, 
I was just thinking about uh, when you said the, the idea of the other of civilization. Uh, I was thinking of the work of Diana K. Davis, uh, if you know her, um, uh, about the representation of the desert and the, you know, like it's archetypal opposite, but it, in this case, it wasn't the polis, it was the, the forest. Um, and and how the forest is, you know, like uh, represented as normal and productive versus the ruined and defective desert, uh, which is basically like a colonial uh, construct. Um, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, do you have any suggestion for a text that we should read? We can. I can add, simply add it to the syllabus. Uh, I mean, it's it's manual for the, for a future desert, uh, which also like I read your text uh, in this book. Uh, where's the concept? Oh, that's the old text. Yes. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, that book. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I haven't read it. I haven't read it. I haven't yeah. read it. I I think definitely it should go. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Sure. If you can, if you can get a scan or a PDF of that and I'll send it to it me, right I will definitely suggest it for a reading. I'll upload it to the drive right away. Sure, sure. M Megan, uh, my apologies, uh, uh, Paddy. Uh, I think Megan wa wanted to talk, uh, but, you know, it was a little bit... Megan? Is Megan here? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, let me think of... I'm thinking about this. Um, come back to me. So uh, Arman is saying that why specifically desert? Why is it not the forest in the younger sense? You see, forest, uh, I can't remember which text of younger you are specifically mentioning. Is it uh, forest or jungle, right? I mean, Europeans don't have ex specifically a good, yeah, a specifically good distinction between a forest and a jungle, right? Or woods. Um, yeah, well, the desert is an expanse, right? And the main point of what makes desert such a thing is because of its minimalism, right? A forest is not minimalist, it's a stuffy. Desert is by all concrete definitions is a minimalist topos, so minimalist that in fact it would be completely wrong to call it a place. Whereas a forest is a place. Forest is replete with fertility with what we understand of life. Desert. The only thing that can offer with regard to the idea of life would be ropes turning to a snakes, a snakes turning to ropes, lizards, scorpions, and the great god of the desert set. That's all about it. And a bunch of hyenas. It's really the idea of life here, right? The idea that you can deforest, you can deforest uh, a forest to make a city, but you can do the same thing by undesertifying a desert to make a city, as you know uh, very well uh, in Middle East. Except that any sort of city that you build on top of the desert always, by definition, will carry over the, the wisdom of the desert, right? It's cunning. And that's why it's very different sorts of thing. I don't think that forest uh, can, be, can be a candidate for, for that sort of thing.
any any person people uh, who have or padish uh, or uh, yes and andrew Good evening. hello um so i was um thinking of um what you mentioned about desert being the other of philosophy and uh, in some sense uh, uh, i'll take some long shots over here in terms of uh, isn't isn't philosophy itself the othering of the presupposed in some sense um i i was also i also got intrigued into this course precisely because of uh, of the rise of monotheism that was mentioned and i think in that othering of of philosophy uh, the rise of monotheism happens as an articulation of of the real in some lacanian sense uh, the thing which lacan borrowed from heidegger um uh, a real hinged upon signified as the monotheistic principle as the other primarily i i don't know how that makes sense but uh yeah, yeah no 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 i no, no absolutely absolutely yes philosophy is also a desert in its own right um but as i tried to mention the sooner philosophy resolve its inter internal contradictions with regard to the phenomenon known as civilization however the civilization being defined and the idea of the of polis, the sooner it actually becomes, uh, you know, a desert landscape. That's what I wanted to actually mention. And yes, um, I, I think, you know, uh, I don't, I'm not that much aware of Lacan's ideas about uh, these sort of matters. But I mean, there is a good reason why desert uh, become uh, literally a um, you know, the cradle of monotheism. I mean, all the great monotheistic religions that we have are desert cults. Desert cults, right? Why? Well, there are so many reasons. I mean, you can go to evolutionary dynamics, and I'm going to talk about all of this sort of stuff, the way of life, and so on and so forth. But, but, from idea from from the pr perspective of the grand ideas of well god has always been in a monotheistic sense has been introduced as compositio oppositorium the composition of the opposites and for something to be a god all opposites should be next to one another. It is not as if the oppositions of good and evil, cunning and innocence, so on and so forth, are being elaborated in monotheism, in the idea of perennial ideas of monotheism, but nevertheless, for something to be a god, it needs to have that quality. Compo uh, composito uh, uh, oppositorium, um, the composition of the opposites. And, and you see that it's just not something that can happen in civilization. Civilization does not allow for this. Polis does not allow for this, the composition of the opposites. Essentially, the very conduct of the city is based on one single fundamental perennial function. What is that function? to purge opposites, mm -hmm. to purge opposites, right? To purge the other. And in desert, you get the goddamn ambivalence, ambivalence in the classical sense of Latin, side by side of the opposites. That you get all the opposites of life and death, ghost and the living, the specters, and the citizens, you know, vah, oasis and the desert, mirage and knowledge, veil and unveiling, right? That's, that's so, that is actually one of the main reasons that literally the recognition of desert as, as a certain sort of form, 
platonic form uh, becomes essentially the breeding ground of monotheism, given what God in, is in monotheism, the one, the unit, the onus, is being represented. The onus is always represented as the as a composition of the opposites. And that's what makes God a God. Desert is what makes, breeds gods, not civilization. Andrew. Yes. So kind of on this topic, actually, and funnily enough, since we referenced Dune, um, the text that I kind of wanted to bring into this is the Ur text to Dune, which is Lawrence of Arabia. That right. there, <laughs> yes, that, so we've talked about this idea of an other to the idea of the polis, right? Well, right. there is this also presumable um, creation, or at least the implication of that statement, that we would have to imagine a different sort of populace then, which Lords of Arabia is, is can be seen as this very interesting meditation on the alternation and tension between the concept of people of civilization as men of nature and people of the desert as beings of soul, in a sense. Yes, uh, yes, yes. The subtle bodies, the subtle bodies. But mm how you mujaradi ha, mujaradi. It's it's an, it's a it's a term that mystics usually use mujaradi ha, subtle bodies. Usually translate subtle bodies, ghosts, specters. Yes. And yeah, that was pretty much the basis of that, except, you know, I was going to plug in a little bit of this idea of, okay, if we take the idea of the desert as, I believe Ibrahim al uh once said, as the place where nature is alienated from the soul and soul is alienated from nature, um, how do we then construct an idea of a populace then? that is entirely beings of soul as opposed to these human beings of nature that we have become accustomed to. Right, I, I would say that <clears throat> you should understand where Ibrahim al Kuni is coming from. He's a Tuareg, right? He's a desert nomad of Tunisian uh, deserts, right? Libyan and Tunisian deserts. So uh, it's, it's quite actually a very a specific sort of background. You know that there are Muslims Tuareg, um, but they are not a specific sort of Muslims. In fact, Muslims, uh, Sunni uh, sects, call them infidels. Do you know why? Because they don't pray. They don't fast. They don't, uh, they don't actually uh, follow the practice, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the practical edicts of Islam. Um, so yes, Ibrahim al um coming from a very specific direction where basically monotheism never took hold for good reasons though. Monotheism took hold, converted people, right? Islam converted people, but it is not as if it is uh, what you might call to be you know, the classical paradigmatic example that we can actually deliver uh, with regard to the relationship between deserts and the problem of monotheism, and hence the idea of populence. Monotheism came uh, in great swaths of Arabian uh, deserts, and it created a, sense, a, a fundamental new phenomenon. And, Lawrence of Arabia that you are talking about is actually the exemplification of the rise of monotheism in the desert, right? What do I mean by that? You see, and we, we are I'm merely flash forwarding to later seminars. Uh, for example, think about this. Uh, so, uh, all the sued, you know, the basically uh, the, the progenitors, the forerunners of, uh, of contemporary Saudi Arabia, 
which Lawrence of Arabia deals with it, is essentially a colonial power, right? It's uh, it's not as a colonial power, but 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 many people live by colonial powers. They are desert nomads. They don't know anything else. But they have also oil fields, massive amount of oil fields in Rubal Khali, in uh, Qawar, and so on and so forth. So British forces come. And of course, Great Britain can't actually deal, cannot actually, uh, you know, take hold of these oil fields, these resources in the Middle East without getting into a direct conflict with, yes, a waning, but nevertheless, a still superbly a strong Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, those who don't know what Ottoman Empire is, maybe you should actually see how they put an end to Christian doom. So they can't do it. Uh, they and they don't want the colon. This is a strange sort of thing that we see it repeated and repeated ever again in the Middle East. The colonial powers don't need the Middle East. Literally, they cannot survive here. It's just like Mars. It's like it's like uh, you know Dune. Um, you know, you, you, you can't survive in that sort of environment. I mean, ideologically, practically, strategically, it's just not the hospitable environment. It's not earthly for them. It's not of the police. They all want resources. So finally, uh, Brits, and this is the main point of Lawrence of Arabia, if you actually read between the lines, they are just coming here to exploit the resources and also uh, essentially a start a, a proxy war with the Ottomans, right? Uh, which are both of them are entangled. And uh, it's not as if they want to actually stay here forever. And that was actually one of the greatest things of cunning that colonialists ever did. British colonialism, at least. They come to the Middle East, they come to Arabian Peninsula, not creating a new government, but they appoint a king. Think about this. How cool is it for a desert nomad who is the head of the tribe to be appointed as a king? Of course they are going to go with that. And then it shows a very different sort of twist down the line, this, uh, uh, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, that it creates, <clears throat> I, I talked about this ambivalence side by side of the opposite in deserts. So the Brits catalyze it under the rubric of monotheism. And once it's being catalyzed, you get the ambivalence in full force, an ambivalence toward which the Western civilization as a whole has a zero, literally zero response. It cannot cope with it. Because at some point, these people look like sedentary people. And at some point they look like nomads. Their ideologies look like shit autocracy and kingship, but also just tribalism. Right, so there, there is something going on, which is, I would say that Andrew is more of a contemporary terms. It is not as if it has always been there. And I think that contemporary contemporanization of this chronicling of, of you know, monotheism, the other desert, so on and so forth, and powers of colonialism should be talked in contemporary terms, but desert people haven't been always like this. But nevertheless, I want to say that yes, desert always have moved toward that sort of militarized ambivalence. Uh, 
arena and then paula paula oh paula uh, 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 yes yeah i have a simple question uh can you elaborate uh, what uh, how you define the cunning and the, um define my apologies define what cunning 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 yes okay and uh, uh, as i understand you kind of um, oppose it to the philosophy it is kind of uh other philosophy of other or am i wrong uh, I, I didn't get the last question. My apologies. I think your microphone is a little bit distant from. Yeah, maybe. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. yes, much better. So, my question is. Uh, um... My question is, uh, can we define uh, cunning as uh, the other mode of philosophy, like the philosophy uh, with no civilization? Or... Uh, yes and no. Uh, so the first one, uh, what is cunning? Well, cunning, I mean, uh, one of the best books has been written about uh, what is the meaning of cunning intelligence in Greek culture. It's been written by uh, Verneau and Detienne, you know, cunning intelligence in Greek culture. But I think that uh, that idea of cunning is also very Greek centric, very Greek centric in, in the sense that cunning, cunning is opposed to the conduct of the police or civilization, to the point that uh, Plato goes in the Republic and talks shit about cunning. That whoever practices cunning is a piece of shit of a human being. Particularly with regard to a conduct called trap sitting. And strangely, uh, trap sitting and the way of cunning, militarized sort of cunning, have become essentially Western civilization's agenda of deriding, dismissing, and uh, forcefully trying to eject any sort of threat to civilization, their own understanding of civilization, which is of the way of cunning, right? I mean, I don't need to say this, but I mean, isn't terrorism a way of cunning, right? Yes, enemies are always there to ambush you, particularly if you are an empire. There is nothing in the conduct of war from the ancient times that uh, this allows, uh, you know, the exercise of brutal and pure cunning. So cunning of the way that Plato is even talking about is not real cunning. Desert has cunning. So cunning intelligence, what you might say, what it is, well, it's a form of knowledge. But what sort of knowledge, you might ask, is a form of knowledge which is fundamentally, deeply entangled with the idea of technique or the skills. It is not Aristotelian idea of know that theoretical life of a philosopher, but a know that which is already a know-how, a technique, a skill, knowing how to do certain sort of things. The other people don't do it. So yes, that's, that's cunning. And cunning in that sense and manifests in navigation, I don't know. Like, for example, how you circumvent a certain sort of obstacle or 
how you attack your enemy uh, from, <clears throat> from a certain sort of flank, or you create mirages for your, uh, for your enemies. And isn't it the greatest sort of idea of the desert? It beckons the enemies of the deserts only to swallow them whole. This is the greatest grandest Matisse of all. It is the draw of the desert which beckons all enemies towards itself. Monotheism already understood it before the mystics and before the mystics, the tribes, the desert nomads. There is nothing to the desert other than an allure, a seduction, a seduction that is just there for completely cunning means. It is the other's weaponized side. Whereas philosophy has its own weaponized side and civilization has its own, uh, own weaponized side, dealing with rival other is not defenseless. I mean, this is the, th the thing that desert actually shows the other is not defenseless. Desert has a fundamental weaponization at its core. And this weaponization is the draw of the desert, the luring of the enemy to a horizon of cunning and ambivalence within which the preconditions of civilizations start to falter. I have another question then. Uh, you said about Plato and can you uh, say why he criticized uh, cunning uh, in Republic? Why? Yeah, I mean, there, there are certain sort of things, you know, because, because Plato in a certain sort of way is a misreading of Socrates. I mean, there are two readings of Socrates, right? And that leads to two branches of philosophy. One you might call to be the cynics, or who think that they're closer to the spirit of Plato. I mean, sorry, Socrates. Uh, cynics, like Diogenes of Latrius, Diogenes of Thebes, Hipparchia of Maronia, and so on and so forth. Militant, militant about the execution of moral virtues outside of civilization, out of the established boundaries of the police. And then there would be Plato who, who simply sees that certain sort of conduct, uh, I don't know, um, are just not the sort of conduct that a police should actually ever engage with or exercise. What are these sort of conducts? Well, one of them is trap setting. Because in idea of Plato is that if polis is powerful enough, and now he's not saying that, he's really not saying that, but he's already implicitly thinking the relation between power and politics, that if polis is powerful, then why the fuck should a civilization lay traps for its enemies? And hence, the model citizen of civilization should never actually create a trap. They can hunt, but they cannot avert trap because trap is the way of the weak. On the assumption that civilization is more powerful, right? And then this, this idea gets transported essentially in European philosophy and European ide ideology of politics. Behold, do you know anything about the Black Yagers? Mm, no, not much. So, where do you think that militarization of Nazi Germany came from? Right. 
Militarization <laughs> comes from a long tradition of European things that, well, you know, <clears throat> yogur, which is, which is like a yogur infantry, you have it in Germany before even, you know, the rise of Nazis, far older in Europe in different sort of uh, dialects. A yogur uh, is usually a shekarchi, a, 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 a hunter, a hunter, right? But, but there are uh, specific subtleties in the word hunter, those who actually hunt and those who set traps. It is actually quite clear that in European culture, those who set traps, you know, following Platonic sort of line, are always criminals. So, except that they are skillful, they are technicians, tacticians and strategists, all combined. They are so great. Crystallized one battle tank in a human being. And they don't want to criminalize these people. They criminalize them. Yeah, they, they, you, if you are a, tra a, a trap set setter in Europe, uh, at, you know, in 17th century, they arrest you. They arrest you. They arrest you for misconduct against civilization and against the animals. But that's just their fucking bullshit. It's just like that you are trying to do some sort of methods that is against the civilization. But they know, as a civilization, they need these people. So what they are doing is that they conscript the yagers, the hunters, the, the illegal trap setters into their own ranks. They create a new cavalry, new units of military formation, merely made of trap setters, the yagers. And then, lo and behold, Germany has this sort of tradition. And right at the onset of the Nazi regime, all the black hunters, black hunter means an illegal hunter, right? A trap setter, are being put into a brigade. What is the purpose of this brigade? You might ask. The purpose of this brigade is to fight the other, the Jew, the gypsy, the Roma people, the terrorists, the partisans, the bandits, in a way that a regular military man cannot fight. And hence, this becomes the moment where Nazi regime creates one of its most lethal and brutal brigades, the Black Yaga, the Black Hunters. Often chosen from political prisoners, ambivalent communists, serial killers, pedophiles, predators of all world unite. That sort of stuff. So yeah, that's that's the idea of cunning, and 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 this relation uh, with militarization, with with civilization, and so on and so forth. So yes, no, I mean civilization has also uh, its own ways of cunning, but it is a cunning always put at the service of power, as opposed to deserts, nomads. For whom power, just like American dollar, make no sense. There is no economy for power. There is no economy for exchanging the greenback in the desert. Paula. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, this is a pretty short question, but I wanted to know if we do have any kind of uh, proof or a guide 
to think about the desert desire because uh, from a Western civilization point of view, uh, which is kind of, um, in brief terms, um, a kind of uh, masculine desire to, for example, the desert as a feminine um, blanket space in which um, we can extract or we can, I don't know, maybe find uh, some resources or whatever. Um, I wanted to know if we know what the desire, the desire desires basically, because um, thinking in this opposition between this uh, the desert as an other civilization and the Western civilization um, places my reflection um, in some way in a correlation between them as the desert has no identity, proper identity in itself, but uh, in confrontation with the Western civilization or the police. So um, I was thinking if may if we can think about the desert desire or something like that, because uh, usually in these films like Lawrence of Arabian or Dune, um, the people from desert just want to be living alone. But um, I don't think that mm, the whole desire of desert can be um, summarizing that line actually. Okay, this is a very complex, very good, superbly magnificent question. I mean, look, I, I can only say one thing here before uh, you know spoiling the entire seminar. And uh, you know, uh, my friend Kirsten uh, will come and talk about some of these sort of issues at some point uh, as a guest speaker. So uh, make no mistake, desert, by all definitions, is, uh, as I said, uh, the locus of concrete militarized ambivalence, compositum oppositorium the composite of the opposites, just like God. Meaning that you get side by side the extreme of patriarchy and the extreme of matriarchy. Make no mistake, absolutely, in the desert, you don't get anything. Like the so-called, you know, egalitarian critiques or critiques of patriarchy. There is no such a thing in desert. Desert, you get literally patriarchy in its most crystallized and tyrannical ways. And you also get the extreme of matriarchy. That is the ambivalence of the desert, right? And I think that the Western civilization always tries to, you know, um, try to literally, even in, in these sorts of arenas, it tries to somehow stamp its own egalitarian ways of the police upon the desert. No, the desert doesn't accept any of this sort of stuff. It is as the old mystics knew it, desert is a false god. And a false god, always, already, is the composition of the opposite, to the sheer ambivalence of ideas. You get patriarchy, you get matriarchy, you get egalitarianism, you get fascism at the same time, side by side. It is not as if desert is a purified. And I'm not here to give this rosy story about the desert. No, desert is what you should be afraid of, not civilization. Lucas. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so. 
I have two points and I'm going to uh, make them at the same time. Um, the first one is a notion uh, which by your expo exposition so far, I think maybe you will disagree. And I have the reference for that somewhere, but I don't know uh, where I read this, but is the notion of uh, an empire as being characterized by uh, the responsibility of managing or having a desert. And I'm thinking here like- uh, Don't make up as soft now. What is the reference? Tell us the reference because that's a punchline here. <laughs> so I, I, I know where I have. <laughs> uh, and I'm thinking like the, the process of unification of huge countries like right. uh, Brazil, the United States, Russia, China, they all have a, a deserts inside of them, right? Uh, Shed so deserts I'm, I'm, or good deserts, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and the other point I wanted to make was uh, you said that like you can't deforest the forest, but you can't the desert a desert, right? But uh, I'm thinking of the Amazon rainforest and actually, Underneath the Amazon rainforest is a desert, right? Which is why it's actually so, um, it's an extra reason for why it's in a certain way so, so stupid to deforest the Amazon in order to have agriculture there because the soil is awful. So, um, the, but in a way, the, uh, like the, the Amazon rainforest, for what it's understood, it's like more of a, a garden in a sense that has been gardened by indigenous people in, in the Amazon for thousands and thousands of years, right? It, so if you remove it, the, the forest, the indigenous people would die too. And because of that, the forest wouldn't, uh, it's not possible for it to be regrown, right? Uh, but it's true, actually, that um, they don't the de desert the de desert there, right? They just yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I understand where you're going with that. Yes, desert, right? And and of course, there is a huge amount of oil um, underneath the desert, underneath the the, the Amazon rainforest. Right. right. I mean, this is, yes, yes, no, I mean, uh, when uh, Arman and uh, you brought the forest, yeah, no, I can, I can see, I can see uh, the, the, the sort, sort of, kind of like, a, you know, um, sinister proximity between desert and a jungle and a forest but I still I would say that look uh, you see a for a jungle an Amazonian jungle it usually have something a phenomena uh, that people I don't know exactly the word for it in uh, Portuguese um, it's called the old growth the old growth what is the old growth the old growth is the idea that you know you have an expanse of land and there are so many trees like just so many trees and these trees shed their leaves right not over a year not over a thousand years but over a hundred and million years and what it actually creates this shedding of leaves constantly without taking the leaves away to empty and make it a forest, it creates something, a phenomenon called the old growth. So you get hundreds of meters of old growth. Usually it looks like a goddamn swamp. Leaves, worms, insects, ants, 
corpses, all mingled together over hundreds and millions of years. Well, you know, it's very taxing sort of work to clean the dead out of your place. That I would say is the very idea of the forest, is a place that's very taxing to remove the corpses of the dead. And hence, if you don't remove the corpses of the dead, it leads to a fertility, a jungle, where there would be an ecosystem. And there would be idea of life running rampant with no consequences. Except that desert is not like that. In desert, there would be no corpse on the sand. Everything is buried. Everything is parched. And literally, there is no old graft. Desert is the only place in which both the idea of growth and regrowth on one side and the idea of degrowth make no sense. The corpses are always buried. There is nothing to see. And yes, from a, from a mystical span, a standpoint, from the mere sheer uh, presence of certain sort of ideas that haunt the desert, I would say that desert is totally different from a jungle. Desert literally never subscribe to the idea of life as we know it. Uh, Rodolfo. Yes, hi. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, besides defining the differences between the ecosystems, uh, that uh, there's uh, also a tradition of thinking of the desert in in, in the Greek culture. Uh, oh, the in, Greek, in, sorry, my apologies. Greek what civilization. Yeah? Huh? Yeah, uh, desert in uh, Greek civilization. Greek, Greek. Uh, yeah. So, so they have. Uh, what, what was it that you were saying uh, that they have? Yeah, maybe I, I was talking too fast and bad because. No, 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 no. My apologies. No, no, no. I just like. Oh, um... Yeah, no. That there is a, a tradition of thinking the desert as something pulsional too, and something like the the way where there's a some kind of. Um, it's other other world. I mean, world. I mean, I, I'm thinking on Lycurgus, who was uh, a judge in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that decides later to to go to the desert after he made love. I mean, he regulates his town, and when it's working, he decides to to banish himself, how do you say it, to expatriate himself to the desert? Yes, so, yes. Like a, there, are, there are some examples, yes. And then I th I'm thinking also that that this, uh, this is like a, a, a place, maybe more close to the unconscious or, or the desire, play, a, a desire earth or a desire locus. Because also I'm thinking on a beautiful small novel called Gates to Heaven that mm -hmm. about a, the um, this um, group of youngsters in the in the Middle Ages that go, go, go from France to to the Crusades and they uh, and the the way of the novel is like it's always in first person and changes from 
uh, one voice to the other. I mean, one boy, then a girl, then a, a, another boy, then another girl, and it's like a, a worm of uh, desire and confusion. And uh, they finish in the desert. I mean, the 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 final the final lines are about getting lost in the sand. I mean, and this is something that that is curious for me, like the idea of this plain space with different capacities of uh, or really slow capacities of fertilization or regrowth. Uh, that you were talking about a few moments ago, and but how? Uh, I mean, what what happens with these corpses? What happens with these uh, laws that get ostracized in the desert? Well, I mean, uh, you don't. There are no corpses virtually in the desert. There are only ghosts. Right. That's the whole point of the desert. It doesn't hold any secret buried. All the secrets are on the surface as a specters and ghosts and shades and mirages. That's the difference between the law of the burial in the desert and the law of the burial in civilization or in polis. Uh, I would say that, yes, there are, there are examples of, you know, people from the Greek uh, times to, I mean, I, I don't know, romantic, romantic um, uh, 19th century romanticism will go to the Middle Eastern desert. But I mean, a lot of this is based on a certain sort of, I would say, if I may say so, uh, tikkunist, tikkunist, right? Communization theory, Tikkunis nostalgia for what civilization could be, but it is not. When a Western person goes to the desert, it only wants to see reprieve from civilization. But when a tribe's person lives in the desert, he, that person is fundamentally indifferent to the ways of civilization. Civilization's unilateral uh, relationship with the desert is merely based on the shoddy axioms of civilization itself. So the one who escapes civilization, the way of the polis and goes to the desert in exile, often it is the case that that person has a nostalgia for a better civilization of the same kind, but not a thought that can rethink and renegotiate and redefine civilization as such. Yeah, mostly like the saints that go to the desert to live in the... Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, saints are just like, uh, I mean, saints are just like bad prophets, right? I, I mean, prophets are already bad, right? Saints are even worse. Uh, they're, they're just like, you know, they, they're the archetypes of the powers of colonialism, right? They got disturbed and disillusioned by the religion. So how about this? We get two, how about two months? How about two years? How about two decades of meandering in the desert such that we can rediscover a civilization we could have but we don't. Well, my answer to that, shut the fuck up to the mystics of that sort. Of course. <laughs> uh, Parham. 
Hi, um, I was gonna ask a question, but I think it gave my uh, it gave the answer by saying "shut the fuck up, mystics." Um, I my question I was gonna ask you about the uh, kind of this American idea of the desert, the spaghetti western movies or Lucky Luke cartoons. Uh, love them, being, love them. You all. know, being yeah, being televised in Iran and being dubbed Super in Iran and. Great. Yeah, Iranians being obsessed with that, and also like, you know, this uh, kind of I I think it's not an accidental idea. Uh, accidental yes, it's not that. accidental idea. It's it's just like the unconscious of the desert, the draw of the desert. Yeah, and and the idea that you know the biggest Iranian population out of Iran is, um, Los Angeles, and you know you're like being a, kind of LA is on the edge of a desert in some sense, and you know. <laughs> This, uh, um... uh, yes, yes. I mean that that that, that really, really. Uh, uh, you know what I was say, talking about this whole idea that look, in the desert, it's not as if you are getting like emancipation. There is no emancipation mm. in the desert. You get the extreme of patriarchy and extreme of matriarchy, mm. extreme of left, extreme of right, extreme mm. of fascism, and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what LA society is about. Mm. I mean, Iranian LA. So you see that they have exported all of the shit that they had <laughs> in the homeland, right? Yeah. Class struggle, poor versus the rich. Uh, you know, oh well, we know we are uh, we are we are this and you are that and so on and so forth. But but if you really think about it as a whole. The LA society of Persianism, right? It's not anything but a tribalist, mm. a tribalist manifestation upon the desert of America. Mm. Except that this is not a good desert mm. to have a life at, right? I was, you know, I was wondering if I was going to ask if you think the difference between that idea of American desert and Iranian desert is again to the idea of goes back to the idea of ambition that this or maybe or maybe um uh, this idea of uh inferiority complex that the iranian uh society of la and and that kind of monarchist iranian uh society wants the ambition wants to add ambition to the desert maybe or wants to build up la on the iranian <laughs> yeah. desert again or... no 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 i mean look look i mean it's just like I, I i don't want to talk about this sort of stuff because it's our yeah sure highly shoddy sort of opinions yeah. and mere opinions i would say that yes i mean uh, these sort of people essentially wanted to be uh, all the saud of the deserts of their yeah, or the cleanest would maybe yeah <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, no, so that's I that's mean, how I want to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yes. No, no. I mean, yes. Hamas Tobre Mikore, Hamas Ahor, except that yeah. both, both the Tobre and Ahor are made of desert sands. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's a very interesting way to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry if my question was not much no, relevant no, to the discussion. Good. Sorry about it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I uh, talked a little bit farcy here. No, 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 no. That's that's great. Yeah, no. Thank you, <laughs> uh, Ilya. Ilya, I think you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. I might attempt to bring in mathematics into this discussion. And uh, I would specifically refer to some parallels that I found um, through my reading of Mundus Imaginalis by Henri Corbin. Uh, and uh, the Platonian um, ontology of uh, mathematical objects. Again, my reading of Plato would be mediated by one article by Andre Rodin um, on called identity and categorification. Sure, sure, sure. 
yeah. where yeah, uh, where Rodin claims that Plato um, locates mathematical object in some in some intermediary space in between pure ideas and the, the physical objects. Wow. So, so mathematical objects um, distorted copies of ideas and material objects are distorted copies of uh, mathematical objects and hence also of ideas. And this is um, somehow akin to the laws according to which um, this imaginal space um, um, described uh, by Corbin um, functions where um, again um, the objects the, um, in this world they um, they rather on a less abstract um, level that the pure ideas of the of the purely right. space um so yeah without without going deep into details um i just gonna drop it here that maybe we can also look uh, no i mean uh that that would be uh, yes. strangely what you are actually saying here um is the very idea uh that shahabadin yahya Surabadi, uh the persian philosopher and mystic put out there literally this is before Kant, right? I mean, you should understand, you know, the whole by the transcendental philosophy. It's not as if it's just like the invention of Kant. You know, those gradations between the sense and the understanding is by no means Kant's invention. And it is definitely not European in nature. This is completely, thoroughly at the base, no Platonist, and by extension, Islamic. This is literally what Islamic philosophers have always been talking about. That, look, there are different gradations between sense and understanding. And sense and understanding, you know, alam uh, shahud, alam ghiyab, you know, the, the 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 realm, the realm of absence and the realm of presence. Uh, except that the realm of absence doesn't mean the absence in a in a, in a Western sort of sense, but rather uh, the, the whole idea. The idea is absent from the presentifying impressions upon the senses, right? That's what olam ghayb, the occult, actually means. Occult uh, literally doesn't mean anything, uh, well, maybe now, but back then, occult didn't mean anything supernatural, but literally the idea that, well, you know, uh, the extremity of senses and extremity of the intellect, the noesis, the noetic functions, uh, they have, they have uh, bridges, and this bridge is gradational, right? That, you know, over you know, so many domains, it can connect back to understanding, understanding back to senses. Uh, but uh, whatever that its nature, is something that is fundamentally uh, what you might call to be um, uh, neither of this, neither of that, but rather both of this and both of that. So yes, this is this is what Sohrevardi uh, talks about in terms of the eighth climate, Eklim uh, Hashtun, the eighth Eklim, which is literally uh, the, the 
Persian board, the, the Arabic board for climate, the Greek idea, understanding of the climate, and not in today's sense. So uh, it's the eighth, eighth, eighth climate that, look, if you have this massive amount of range of gradational bridging between senses and understanding, there should be, there should be, by philosophical speculation alone, there should be a realm where you are in a specific domain of co cogitation where you are neither of the senses nor of the intellect, but both of them at the same time, in an ambivalent terms, side by side, right? And this is what some of them call all amal method. Henri Corbin uh, translates as the world of images, except that it's not really image. It's exactly, if you really want to be accurate about translation, is the world of schemata. Remember that in Kant, the, the vast gap between senses and understanding ultimately bridged by certain sorts of mysterious entities, which can cause in, you know, in some of those highly dubious parts of the critique of pure reason, that they have sprung forth from the darkest recesses of the soul, right? These are called schemata. It's where the source of both understanding and senses come from. Imagination is centered around entities called schemata, rules, which are neither purely sensory nor purely noetic. And the desert, in that sense, in Sohrabadi's sense, belongs to a realm that is neither this, neither that, but both of us at the same time, except that it is not fusion of both, but rather them standing side by side in ambivalence, understanding and senses. And that is all about method. The world of the image, the world of schemata. And you know what schematas are? Pure techniques. This is what the legacy of the desert is, my dear friends. Desert does not want virtue. Desert doesn't want knowledge. Desert want, doesn't want politics. All it has are skills, techniques. The techniques which undergirds the realm of the eighth sense, schemata, between senses and understanding as Kant truly understood it. Yet he always belatedly dragged that question, what are the source of schemata? He says, from the darkest recesses of the soul, the darkest recess of the soul in our story, my dear friends, is the desert. Maxim again. Go ahead. First, LA is the desert, absolutely. Second, Ilya, I. What you said is amazing. I would really love to hear more from you on this platonic interpretation connection to Andre Rosing, the, the mathematical interpretation of Plato. That's I would really love to hear more. So so, so I mean 
So but, Roden yeah. has has this idea, you know, he's is a it's like a uh, is a what's that? A topo, uh, uh, what's that? Topological geography, right? Topos theory, category theory, right? Uh, it's like the general Roden's vibe. Yeah, but I want to poke at this at the Platonic ideas from a different angle from what Deleuze is doing, and this is ethically instructive for me, because I am myself a very simple-minded person. I'm basically an idiot. And idiots are people. Who <laughs> idiots. Do you know what an idiot is, by the way? Idiot uh, is the outlander. The idiot is the person who takes ideas literally. And Deleuze is. No, 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 no. That... Actually, it, the, idiot, the word idiot is coming from, believe it or not, this is actually good for the seminar. The word idiot comes from the Greek, idiota, right? In Latin, meaning that someone who believes that the laws are the only things that protect. Yes, yes, exactly. And I was going to say that cunning is of the same root as can. Can, yes. like can do, the model verb can, to be able to. So it's not the opposite of, or it's not a specific modality of action. It is action itself. And I think a good, I've been thinking about Yagers and a good example of this, Reza, you probably have seen, maybe some other people seen it, uh, Jean Renoir's movie, The Rules of the Game, exactly about mm -hmm. this. You remember this, the yeah. one subplot is the Yager, the Marco, who is the poacher, the Yager, who is seducing the wife of Schumacher, who yes, is yes, the Yager yes, master, yes. the gamekeeper. And this is what platonic idea is for Deleuze, right? There yes, is yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Participated and the participant. So you have to be cunning. And the player is completely aware of this because who is more cunning than Socrates, right? Or who is more cunning than Zeus himself? <laughs> so who, who eats Metis, <laughs> a woman, after raping her, whole, swallows Metis whole. This is this is what Greek culture is ultimately, right? First, you rape another civilization, another technique, set of techniques, and then you swallow it whole. So yeah, uh, the cunning is what I need to learn, but I'm very stupid. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my intervention. Uh, my dearest friends, let's have. Five minutes, five minutes, and we are going to get uh, more questions. Five minutes of rest, and then we get together. All good? All right. See you all in five. Sure.
Freddy, one of those more. <clears throat> Ali Reza, uh, uh, hi. Uh, uh, hi. Do you want to hear me? Do? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I got a question. I can start if everybody's ready. Okay. Um, thank you, Reza. Um, your introduction reminded me of uh, or made me think of Edward Said's lecture, The Myth of uh, Clash of Civilizations. Um, in that context, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations were, uh, given that it essentially acts as the foundation for the so-called uh, American-style democracy being um, imposed onto the world. <laughs> You're catching me off guard on this question. Uh, meaning that... Um... I haven't thought about it, but I had, you know, when when you're contemplating about your ideas of the desert, and then you see the the imperium uh, in uh, interfering, uh, and then you see this sort of uh, rather late liberalist ideas of civilization, Huntington, and so on and so forth then you say, oh, shit, maybe I shouldn't actually teach this class because then I get implicated in that sort of rhetoric, right? Uh, Edward Said versus Huntington. Well, you know, I actually prefer to be on the Said team, even though I have zero sympathy with Said's. Uh, uh, but yes, uh, I would say, uh, I would say this is, this is for now, for now, before before we get to the end of the seminar, I would say that, well, you know, the desert way of life, the desert way of conducting virtues and power, its cunning and so on and so forth, is literally not uh, a paradigm of the clash between civilizations civilization by its own highly contradictory spirit always in conflict within itself has already sufficient means to be in clash with itself and misunderstand the clash of civilization with civilization as a clash between civilization but more so the clash between civilization and the other. Civilization has, is so utterly unconscious of its own way of politics and philosophy in the sense that I just mentioned, the relation between wisdom writ large and polis, that it just merely wants at the end of the day, tells you a story about how it can survive. Except that the way of the desert and its wisdom is a certain sort of organon of telling Western civilization how exactly your civilization will end. Because desert is nothing but the precondition for the life and death of all civilizations writ large. There is nothing to it. Yeah, Western civilization can you know, do all sorts of stuff, right? Feigning its survival, epical, odysseic, battles at the end of the world with the barbarians. But we all know, as children of the desert, how this story is going to pan out at the end of the day. They have no chance. They never had chance. In fact, I would say that civilization writ large, as specified by the Greek city-states, 
And so as the great empires and civilization of that time was the immaturity of civilization. You see, when things, we always, uh, why is that? For example, a watch comes, an Apple watch comes, version 0 0.1. And then the Apple watch 10 comes. And you always say that, well, the Apple watch 10 is better than Apple watch 0 0.01. But why is that? We never tell ourselves this great story that look, just because a civilization came at the beginning is not the paragon of civilization. That sort of civilization is an extinct version of the Apple Watch. Simple as that. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, Marshall. Hey, um, yeah, so my question uh, touches a bit on what you were just saying about technique, um, especially in relation to what Orban was kind of charting out. Um, because, so there's this thing, um, he's talking about the imagination and the imaginal. Uh -huh. He's talking about the mundus imaginalis and the age climate. And somehow they they feel, they seem connected. Um, what? At the same time, I was throughout the whole text wondering about technique and practice. And because at, at the there's a point in this in the in the third section where he says, uh, a strict incognito covers these manifestations. That is why the religious event here can never be socialized. And so it's this moment where people can only be invited to. Um, right. And for me, that was like a, a kind of interesting contradiction between what he was trying to lay out before. The imaginal is something that is a kind of faculty or a kind of um, power of the soul or technique maybe even. And yeah, then right. other these accounts, these these mystical accounts that then follow, that describe this this other geography that's not rooted in the empirical one, but that is somewhere else. And yeah, I'm just wondering what's the the kind of um, connection there to the desert that has or knows technique and is not so interested in power, etc., and politics. Um, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, this is the whole thing. It's the yeah, whole thing. Uh, you know, uh, essentially, our philosophy of technique and, and the relation between philosophy and technique is just is a very new sort of uh, way of talking about technique, right? I mean, look, uh, it's only in twentieth century that people explicitly talk about technique, technique, techne and philosophy, right? And technique becomes something that is just there. And it, it's, it's not like a, it's not like a, a expendable uh, piece of the game. No, it's actually, it's like the queen and the king and the rook and the, and the you know, the bishop. Uh, no. Um, so yes, uh, have you read by any chance Dina Butsati, The Deserts of Tartars? So there is this novel which I really, really suggest, and there, there is a movie even really great, I mean, by all definitions of avant-garde literature, uh, which is made in Iran, in uh, Bam's fort, before the earthquake, about this, about literally this 
sort of question. So the thing is that uh, Din, uh, so the novel is written by Dino Buzzati, uh, the desert of Tartar or the steppe of the Tartar in English translation. And it is about this thing that this naive, innocent white man who has so much future ahead of his life gets a funny idea to join a very secluded fort at the outskirt of civilization, at the outskirts of polis, looking directly into the machinations of the desert. He goes there and he gets acquainted with the conduct of civilization at the outer skirts of its own self-image. Every day and every night, he goes on the parapet on top of the fort, looking onto the steppe desert of the Tatars. With his old telescopic camera, he sees stuff. He literally sees stuff. He sees motions. He sees things by miraculous means of God are being displaced. Today, there is this mound over there. Tomorrow, there is another mound over there. Well, you know, in the desert, nothing actually survives. So how the fuck can you have a mound today and a different mound over there tomorrow? Except that he starts to deceive himself as a Western man. He says to himself, well, you know, I think there is something wrong with my telescope. Then 10 years from now, as he's still guarding the outer skirts of civilization against the outlanders, he sees the same sort of patterns, except that they are a little bit closer, right? He reports it and then they check up his eyes, check his health, he is in a bad health literally in a very, very bad health. No one knows what he's actually consuming, drugs or just pure sand. What is actually quite clear in this story is that it's not his vision that he should blame, nor the instrument of technicity, the telescope, but rather he has been here in this fort for 20 years, now 30 years. He should blame his Western techniques and the overextension of them to the conducts of the way of the desert. So he finally decides to resign. I am not going to be part of this shit anymore. There is no threat out there. There is no threat in the desert. All of this was technical illusions of knowledge, of my background, of my ideology, of my vocation. And yet, for the final time, he goes on the parapet. He puts a telescope over his eye and he sees what is coming. And well, you know what is coming already. Is the horde, the enemies that he should be truly afraid of. They are not enemies of civilization, except that they have a different idea of civilization. And by the time that he sees what has always for the last 30 years been incoming, he truly resigns. 
Western civilization, by all accounts, should cease to exist. So, questions? Al Raza. <clears throat> No, I, I had to lower my hand. I forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so, who wants to talk? So, we, we, we now see that the desert is not some, some purity. There is no purity in the desert. It's only impurity. It's only the worst of all possible worlds. But worst, worst of all possible worlds, you might ask, worst of whose possible worlds? Well, I would say Greek civilization. Any idea of civilization that is merely based on unarticulated and unexamined relations between philosophy and police, between essentially cunning and pragma, practice, and so on and so forth. Lewis. Oh, uh, hi. Um, the question was a uh, simple, uh, simple question. Um, you sent us uh, a link uh, to the Swedenborg Foundation and I have a, a concrete a question, no? We will see something of Swedenborg properly in this uh, seminar? No, no, not Swedenborg, just Henri Corbin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, but yes, but, but yes, there would be, of course, Swedenborg is going to be implicated in all of this. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. No, because I think it's interesting to thinking about those terms of place, non-place, and, and so on, no, in mystical terms, no? Right, 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 right. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yes. And I, I would say that, well, you know, this is the thing that I have. And, you know, most probably you already know who I am. In the sense that I just don't actually subscribe to what Westerners think of mysticism. Yes, I'm a mystic, but I'm a Middle Eastern mystic. That doesn't translate me into what West expects of me to be a mystic, right? I think Swedenberg and so Henry Corbin uh, are essentially mystics in a particularly Western idea. And that all comes back to this idea that they haven't Examine properly the relation between philosophy, wisdom, the love of wisdom, and essentially the place, the topos, the city, the polis, civilization. And hence, their expectation of their mysticism from us Middle Easterners is rather over expectation of civilization from barbarians. Oh, yes, I think, thanks. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking, sorry, a, a little question. You don't think that Swedenborg is a barbarian in Western civilization? Overall, after the Kantian critique to Swedenborg? Yes, but, 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 I mean, look, as I said, you know, uh, civilization always, uh, that whole, you know, Buzzati story that I was just mentioning, you know, civilization always finds barbarian in their own kind. The other of civilization has never been unfolded to the very idea of European or what you might call to be, you know, ancient world civilizations, uh, literally, no. I mean, civilization always wants to find enemies who are both within the ambit of civilization and yet they are rebellions. 
except that desert nomads, the desert dwellers, are not enemies of civilization. They are just indifferent to the idea of the police. And so to transition from that sort of Swedenborg to someone like Ibrahim al Kuni, that would be a, a massive sort of, you know, a day of reckoning, a day of consciousness, so we can understand and look. All Western wants, Western society, Western civilization wants from us is to be more of the same of them, but not indifferent to them. Ultimately, the exact drone strike that will be delivered at some point, hopefully in our lifetime, by the barbarians against the civilization, the so-called barbarian against the so-called civilization, would be something like this, that no, we just don't want your goddamn civilization. We are indifferent to it. It's not as if we envy it. That's the whole point of the desert. Desert does not envy the riches. Uh, oh, Reza, uh, sorry, I, uh, your camera is off. Is, uh, oh, is my apologies, my apologies, my apologies. <clears throat> Thank you. So, uh, Luis. Oh, oh, thanks. Thanks, that, that was all. Oh, by, well, by the way, uh, and what do you think about San Jeronimus in those terms? Who? Uh, San Jeronimus. The father of the church, the father of the Vulgata. Who oh, no. traveled to, to the desert, who was very interesting in those terms. No, no, educate me, educate me here. Uh, I, I... Oh, oh, a father of church who was very interesting in those terms, no, of going to desert, no, uh, and so on, no, and he sets the difference between desert in Christian terms and Rome, no, as a Babylonian. Yes, so yes, 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 yes. No, the Ciceronian yes. dream, no, very famous, no, of, of him, no. Yes, Which yes, yes, a yes. Dream yes. of yes. the desert and so on. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what do I think? Yeah, I mean, this is the thing about me. I mean, I would say that it's not civilization that can make a call upon its deserted citizens or deserting citizens join the desert, it's only the allure of the desert that can seduce you to come to the fold. I would say that civilization is so fucking bankrupt at this point. The idea of the civilization that we do have, I mean, it's not as if I'm anti-civilizational. I mean, it's just that the way that we think about civilization is highly inadequate. And I would say that civilization by no means can talk about the way of the desert or somehow represent or exemplify one of its persons or one of its entities as if they have all of a sudden have come to the illumination of the way of the desert. No, the way of the desert is there. We never paid attention to it. And that way of the desert is the only way to move forward. Full of contemplation, full of solidarity, except not in your own terms, in your Western terms, or my Far Eastern terms, the great civilizations of the old world. This way will unfold. This way will take effect. By the time that you realize that this 
thing has taken effect, it is too late now. The day of reckoning is at hand. Remember, why is that monotheism always has this insistence, a spooky insistence, to have the day of reckoning, the end game, played on a plane called the desert, for good reasons. Because you can no longer lie. You can no longer sophisticate or pontificate. You are bared. Completely naked. In that very arena. Which is the desert, the arena of the ambivalences, which are always already there, but you haven't articulated the relationship between them, good and evil, polis and its other philosophy and ethics, and so on and so forth. Desert has the ultimate revenge, and desert will exact its revenge upon us. Uh, oh, thanks, thanks. Christian. Christian. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, cool. Um, I think this started out as a clarification for myself, but I see in the chat now if uh, Levin and Pradeep have brought up um, Deleuze and Guattari's concept of the war machine, and that's tied to their notion of nomads and nomadology. So sort of tracking back to the point about the Black Yeagers, I sort of interpreted that, I interpreted your point there as being, you know, these black Jaeger sort of exemplify this war machine. They're these more or less anti-civilizational or extra-civilizational forces that get um, captured and then redeployed for the state's purposes. Right, um, right, right. I guess the question that, that I want to ask, and I think for the benefit of everyone in the seminar is, you know, you say that, uh, is there a lot of consonance between your concept of these uh, in different desert nomads, fundamentally indifferent to the polis and and, and um, Deleuze and Guattari's notion of, of these nomadic forces as well. Hmm. I mean, it has been so many years uh, since I have read uh, Thousand Plateaus. I mean, look, uh, yes, I mean, as we know, ATP is somehow um, somehow mangled between the vision of Guattari and the vision of Deleuze. The force of cautionary tales a la Guattari and the forces of the great sense, deterritorialization without a break. To lose. I would say yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, uh, to lose and Guthrie uh, saw something in the nomadic war machine. Except that I think that what they didn't truly understood is that and this has brought up and brought up ever again that, look, uh, when Deleuze and Guthrie talk about nomads, they are not really talking about historical nomads. Yet, they are speaking of the nomads, right? They know the Mongols, they know the Persians, they know the Aryans, they know the Arabic desert nomads. Uh, but they want to make a 
what you might call to be a moral lesson out of it. And literally, to be honest with you, Deleuze and Guthrie's idea of the nomadism is a moral lesson. Look, it's as vile and as banal as a moral lesson that Prophet Muhammad would give you. Why I'm saying this? Precisely because of one single thing. So, well, you know, the desert nomads, they are their raiders. The people of Ghazava raid without consequences, right? And they are also need to be sedentarized because, you know, all nomads ultimately sedentarize and they're making these sort of stories. But to be honest with you, really, generally, they don't understand the meaning of the desert. They understand the nomads who live in the desert. But if Deleuze and Guthrie, two people, and particularly Deleuze, who is into the business of the critique of transcendental philosophy, you should know fucking better. You should understand that the desert is the precondition, the condition of possibility of civilization. It is not as if the desert is simply something that, oh, well, you know, the apparatus of capture, with for girls, despoticism, all of this also happened in the desert. No, he just doesn't know one single thing about the desert. And what, what is that single thing about the desert that he doesn't understand? Is that literally the desert doesn't function. It literally has zero fucking function. Because function is defined by civilization, Desert doesn't have any sort of a status with regard to the, the criteria of functioning or behaving in a normal way, normative way. And then Deleuze tries to say that, well, you know, well, the desert nomads can come to this and that, become extremists of this kind or that kind, but it always wants to somehow reinterpret the way of the outlanders, the barbarians, by way of the civilization. So he is, I would say, to the extreme, twistedly, a philosopher of civilization, not a philosopher of a desert. Reza, I just dropped a quote um, in the chat. So basically, besides invoking the, um, the, the, the figure of desert with regard to nomadic machine, they also speculate on the, uh, on the so-called celibate machine. And they describe exactly what you mentioned earlier on. Yes. Yes, no, no, no. I mean, this is why I was saying, uh, look, uh, Deleuze and Guthrie are extremely careful because they know a huge amount of what you might call to be anthropological knowledge that is required for constructing such a you know, philosophical thesis uh, as in uh, a, a thousand plateau. Uh, yet, they miss one single fact, really. Re this is this is a single fact that the loser philosopher, right, is a philosopher, is a philosopher by extreme degree, and so as I. What is the unconscious mark of a philosopher? The stigma. Well, the stigma is that. We have come from a certain sort of directions of the history of philosophy, and that history of philosophy is informed and realized by a specific relation between polis 
and that which lies outside of it. Yes, so it is akin, what Deleuze tries to do is akin to the postmodernist condition, as, as uh, mentioned by Lyotard, that, that he's in the condition after all these years to criticize and give a critique of philosophy. So that's what Lyotard did in postmodern condition, giving a critique of modernism, of the conditions that eventuate realize modernism. But that is not sufficient, I would say, to understand the very idea of precondition, of the conditions of the critique of civilization, of modernism, of you know, military, of the other, and the and the same, and so on and so forth. So next. We can take one more question and then we can wrap up. Sure. Uh, Karis? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, I was thinking about uh, the question of civilization in, uh, in terms of the desert. Um, as you represented here. And I was actually trying to to ask the question of what civilization is like, what are the limits of this? What are all these things that could be called civilization or part of it? And actually what you say at the end, at the end I think is uh, is um, is the strongest, uh, not the strongest, the I think that seeing it through a negative way, through negativity, um, could we say that civilization can be anything that could be rendered as more important than life? Yes, yes. I would say that yes, civilization can be rendered more important than life. But uh, a life that is not explicated fully is not worth of being called a life, right? So when we are actually trying to explicate the idea of life, you know, biology has done that, and so has post Aristotelian turn uh, philosophy trying to come up with an idea that look. It's not as if life is important, but the forms of life. And yes, I would say that civilization, at some point in time, it's not really clear when it happened. Probably accumulation of, of silent transformation, of silent, silent changes, uh, came up with this idea that, well, you know, um, it's not life. That civilization is about, but giving a safe haven to the forms, a specific forms of life, a species beings, right? And then this is something that I think that needs to be brought up, made explicit, exposed, precisely because an assumption, right? It's an assumption that hasn't been made explicit in the sense that, uh, yes, forms of life, great, great, good, magnificent, but why, what is actually in the jurisdiction of something like philosophy or theology or politics to rally up the forms of life as if it has, uh, you know, complete, you know, jurisdiction over the forms of life, as if civilization is the only thing that is there that has the final saying 
questions about the conducts of the forms of life or what the form of life can be? Of course not. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Sabi. Hi, hi, uh, Heather. Uh, how do you see the the thinkings in, in the the book Desert, the anarchist book Desert, and and your thoughts uh, about Desert, how they relate and 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 how they not relate? I haven't. I haven't. Uh, which book are you referring to? The the anarchist one. I I I'm you know I'm a very illiterate person. I hardly ever read books. It it's called a uh, desert, and and the and the the author is anonymous. So... Okay, okay. Can can you can you give me a the what am I, the the presses the the punchline of the of the, of the book? Oh, see, it, they they. They talk about how climate climate change uh, and uh, uh, would would cause desertification and the de desertification uh, caused by by the climate change will interfere in the politics and and civilization. It's a an a anti civilization. Right and uh, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, this is kind of, I would say that, look, if from what I hear, um, my, my interpretation of what you just said can be said to be accurate, and I'm merely saying that most probably it's not accurate. I would say that, well, yes. I mean, in the way of the desert, The tillie, the tillers of the planet, right? The tillers of the planet is never written. What does that mean? Meaning that for the desert people, now you can think about who are these desert people? Those people who are outside of us, or those people whose worlds have failed. Regardless, why the fuck the people of desert should actually give a cent or two about climate change? Because Ruz al Qiyamat, the day of reckoning, the end game, has always already been at hand. Except that civilization never listened to this call for the end game, which is always too early and always too belated. Max. I'm going to surprise you. I actually have a question. <laughs> um, so um, here nearby there is a philosophical research society which you've probably heard about and they have a really good library and i know it is a um, huge request so i'm i don't want to impose anything on you but uh, maybe you could um, compile some kind of a selection of uh, literature on a more esoteric side that would kind of vibe with this seminar that would be possible to find there because they have a lot of rare books that are unavailable or why sure, 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 sure. but yeah my problem that i am very stupid so i only read english and another barbaric language that i want to mention but uh, <laughs> your so, yeah, you see, you see what i mean worse than mine yes yes <laughs> yes i <have> <laughs> <laughs> so yes i have actually Top of my mind, I mean, things that makes you really excited about the, the, the phenomenon called the desert. I would say that one of these would be Rasalat al-Ahl al-Ashq. 
uh, the book on the ways of love. You know, Valentine Day is close. Can I pause the read channel? Or maybe, like, it's not urgent, but that would be it, really it's, cool it's too, yeah. of Fella Ahl al uh, I mean, it hasn't been translated literally to but 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 so many parts of it have been translated in Russian, in English, and so on and so forth. That's Sohavardi. Sohavardi. Shawbidin Sohavardi. And it's it's utterly out of this world. Yeah. What is ishq? What is love? What is illumination? I mean, only desert can give you illumination. I'm going to talk about this next uh, the next session. Uh, so that's one. The other one that I have in my mind is Ibn Nafis, Theologicus Autodidactus. Um, so this is this this is actually a very interesting sort of text. First of all by all definition, is the first sci-fi ever. How cool is that? Islam produces sci-fi, not Western civilization. So he writes this as an answer to another book, Hayyab uh, Yaksan, which is, which is a book uh, of a uh, is in Latin called philosophical autodidactus, meaning that the innate knowledge of philosophy, uh, you know, in the Socratic way of learning the unforgotten knowledge, uh, that becomes all you need. Except that in uh, theological autodidactus, this takes a fucking different sort of turn. Look, knowledge is not something that can ever be given to you by philosophy. If philosophy only claim of knowledge is established methods. A method is not a method unless it's a technique. And a technique is not a technique unless it knows the draw or the way of the desert. Right, shifting sands and so on and so forth. So that, and then uh, finally, there. I'm pretty sure that this is absolutely not translated. The other two were translated. Uh, Ibn Hamedani, wal uh, wal So this is this is this is literally the precursor to the idea of encyclopedia. al Qazwini and after that, so many other people to Diderot, idea of cyclopedia, Novalis, and so on and so forth, all actually have based their idea of the climate, the climate. You, you see, climate is a very specific word in Greek, the climate, eklim in Arabic. It means, it means that, look, we are merely, you see, the way of the knowledge and the way of the virtue is as if you are merely sliding upon different slopes. Klima in Greek simply means the way of the slope, climate, right? So we are sliding over different slopes. And then we think maybe we are enemies or friends, but so long as you understand the meaning of the climate, the slopes, because the slopes are continuous, right? You become both friends and enemies, and that's the way of the desert, right? Except Western civilization just doesn't understand anything about this sort of thing. And every time they are going to talk about the way of the cunning of the desert, 
they will formalize it. Abductive reasoning, so on and so forth. <clears throat> Hadi. Hello, um, I had uh, two primary questions. One with regard to uh, the illuminative possibility, uh, which I think, especially with the concept of Muarif in uh, Sufi, uh, Shams al-Muarif is how I got introduced to uh, Muarif as a concept. Um, but I think that will be covered in probably the next class. Uh, I have been interested in um, uh, with uh, with the support of my Shia friends in Islamic theology. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, apart from that, I think for today's session, uh, I would like some clarity on, of course, I, I don't intend to defend DNG for any other reason. I mean, I no, just for philosophical clarity in that sense, or even theoretical clarity. Um, of what you had mentioned as their critique of war machines was essentially the uh, their lack of understanding of that war machine does not have a function, which they had ascribed to nomad. Um, if I had understood understood you right as of now, but you also spoke of a technique um, that the desert possesses. Um, I asked in chat as well, which is my nomad space, that where. Uh, couldn't there be a parallel between what you mentioned as technique and the function of war machine, as you call it, of DNG? Of course, uh, their function is not the function of the state apparatus, which appropriates the war machine by their own thesis. Um, it is the it is a kind of uh, abstract know-how, repetitive in some um, destructive fashion, uh, which is very much similar to the kind of desert that you mentioned. I just need some clarity on that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, a great deal can be said about this, but I mean, think about this. You see, the way of the civilization, the way of the police, and which is which for right now we can call Western philosophy. Uh, it's something that constrains and narrows down the scope of the techniques of the Matisse and Conning. Meaning that, as I said, you know, Plato doesn't actually is good with a trap setting. And then, yet I said, you know, in the history of European militarization, there has been a massive amount of call to arms by the black pouchers, the 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 the, the black hunters, right? The, the trap setters, so to speak. So it's not as if Western civilization is utterly deprived of cunning. Except that its understanding of cunning, its realization of cunning is utterly unconscious. It parasitizes upon the laws of civilization. Whereas in the desert, you don't have such sort of parasitism. There is no such a thing as what one can do or what one cannot do in the way of warfare. But there are always moral virtues with which desert is replete. And this is what we are seeing in contemporary times of ours, the war, this war in the Middle East between an apartheid regime and the people of Palestine quite crystallizes what has always been the case. On one side, you get a military adopted or adapting uh, capitalist and Greek civilizational means of warfare. On the other side, you see the pure way of Matisse. To not just resist, but lure enemy one inch 
after another into your own non-kujabad, non-place. And that's our legacy, our Middle Eastern legacy. We have been luring enemy for so many years. And the culmination of this war shall be crystallized. There is no empire once the city meets its other in the desert. So, thank you. Thank you, Reza, for this amazing session. And thank you, everyone, for the great discussion. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, Reza, about the uh, the readings for the next seminar, how you how you prefer to... Um... No, I mean, uh, the, the next reading would be the Henri Corbin, uh, you know, the Eighth Climate, Nakuja Abad. I mean, because we didn't really talk about it. It was just yeah. like... Yeah, that, that will be the next reading. The next one, okay. And uh, how do you prefer to go about the presentations? Uh, uh, in class or do you prefer that it be pre-recorded and sent to you? Pre-recording would be magnificent precisely because, you know, if you actually pre-record your presentations, all of us can actually watch it. It doesn't really, you know, degrade the timing and, you know, the as you have noticed, these seminars are, you know, full of discussions and it's always time dilates yeah. unnoticedly. So if you can pre-record, that would be much amazing. And if you want to pre-record, I would say that, look, three of you, four of you, Max, gang together, uh, create a, a great presentation for 20 minutes. Either post it beforehand as a recorded video, or if not, no, come. But uh, that would be that would be the greatest thing because you know, um, I think individual presentations all always often end up with meandering. Collective collaborations always sharp on point and convergent. Definitely. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Reza, again. Thank you, thank you, everyone, and see you all next week. Love you all, and have a great weekend. Bye.